Um, so Simon Bowton is the editor at um, Not Any Young Readers. Um, he's someone that we've had the absolute pleasure of getting to know well at Accord over the past, I think, year, year and a half. Um, last year, Accord um, signed a publishing deal with um, Norton Young Readers to publish um, some of the, 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 the books that Accord um, has been working with our authors on. So that's um, that was extremely exciting for us. Um, one of the things we've really appreciated about um, working with Simon has been his deep commitment um, to this idea that children should read about stories all over the world. And um, what matters in stories is um, the universality of a language, um, of, a, of a language of characters, of of plot um, that can speak to young readers, no matter where they are from. Um, so we're so delighted um, to have you here with us, um, Simon. Thank you. Well, Deborah, thank you. And, and Sarah too, thank you for having me. And, and it's been, um, it, this is one of the most exciting things that I'm doing in my publishing life at the moment is working with Accord and working with the authors that you've, um, you've nurtured and brought forward to publication. So um, it's a real pleasure to be here and, and be part of the process in a different way. Um, it's early over here. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in New York. Um, I've just had my coffee, so um, and, and more or less um, ready to talk. Um, so, um, and I, if I may, I'm going to share, my, I prepared a little bit of a, some slides to go with, with the um, presentation. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, if I can, let me just do that. Because I'm going to make you a host and then you'll just um, make me the host back. <laughs> you go. Okay, when we finish. Your session. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, I'm, you should be able to see... Um, you should see, be able to see photo. me in short now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, you know, this is a way of making sure that you're watching because there's usually a chuckle when this picture comes up. So um, I found that one of the things about doing presentations on Zoom is that jokes kind of disappear into thin air. So um, anyway, I heard a chuckle, so that's good. So I know you can see, uh, I know you can see my screen. So yes, um, right. thank you for the introduction. I'm the, I'm the publishing director at Norton Young Readers, which is a relatively new imprint in uh, the United States, but, um, new in the sense that we're the children's publishing division of a very old U.S. publisher. W.W. Um, w. Norton is just coming up on 100 years. Um, it's the largest remain, largest, I was going to use the word remaining, it's the largest independent publisher in the United States, independent trade publisher, um, and somehow has managed to survive a century without publishing for children and young adults. So here I am, to change that. We're in our uh, second, third year of, publish of our publishing program. And um, it's a very exciting time. It's an exciting time in, uh, you know, Norton's life, but I think it's also an interesting time in US publishing for reasons that are both um, sort of stimulating and perplexing. And what Sarah and Deborah asked me to do was just talk a little bit about the US market, um, what's going on in the US, um, and how to sort of think about the United States as a publishing as a publishing market, how we sell, how we operate, and, and sort of what our perspective is. Um, I realize that uh, many of you may know the US market a little bit, many of you may not. Um, so I'm going to kind of come at this as if it's relatively new. Um, for those of you who have more familiarity with US publishing, I apologize. Um, for those of you who have less and have questions, I would be very happy to um, to answer. Um, as you can tell from my accent and from my um, from my shorts in that picture, um, I didn't grow up in the United States. I'm I'm a I'm a, a, a an expat. I'm an immigrant. Um, I came to the U.S. in uh, the mid 1980s uh, from from after graduation from college. As I said, uh, children's and young adult publishing in the United States. And I thought the way perhaps to to sort of tackle this was kind of backwards um, and start by talking about where books are sold in the US um, um, and what the, the marketplace looks like from a book selling point of view and, and then sort of back into um, back into the publishing part of the industry. So 
Um, when I came to the United States in the mid 1980s, it was a very, um, in a sense, the market was very divided. Um, the, the way we thought of it was as over here on one side, there were um, public libraries and books that were published for schools and libraries and were considered very institutional. They were the award-winning books, the hardcovers, the books that sold on the strength of reviews to libraries and schools and teachers. And then on the other side of the market were what we thought of as mass market, really commercial books that sold in retail. Um, and there was this sort of gap in between those things. And what's happened over the last 20 or 30 years is that that gap has really filled in. That these days, there is really no separation between those two markets as there perhaps was when I started. And there is a whole range of um, publishing that speaks to both the needs of educators and professionals and the needs of consumers. That separation doesn't really exist anymore. And what's happened along with that is that the the, and, and I don't think this is particular to the US, this is, this is true of the industry globally, that children's and young adult publishing has become central to the culture. Um, uh, when I started, I think it was still seen as a little bit of a, you know, a sort of a sweet back order, um, but it's now a central part of the cultural industry. And you see that in Hollywood and everywhere else. So just to say that what's true in the world at large is certainly true in the US. And I think in some ways the US has been um, sort of leading that, uh, that, that, that broadening of the industry and broadening of the market. So where do people buy books in the US? Um, first and foremost, I guess I'd have to say, we'd have to talk about Amazon and online retailers and you know, online retailers really does mean Amazon these days. Um, at this point for the trade, the American trade publishing industry, um, you know, a good, a good, uh, if not a majority, close to the majority of our sales are through online retailers. Um, that is true for children's and for the industry as a whole. Um, so any conversation about um, publishing and marketing children's books in the US now includes thoughts about how those books appear to online retailers and how a cover looks when it's the size of your thumb and how um, people discover books. Um, it's one thing to discover a book in the bookstore or by reading the New York Times book review. It's quite another thing to discover a book by browsing on Amazon. Um, second place we, uh, we think of when we talk about the where people buy books in the US is what we sort of in the industry refer to as national accounts, national book retailers. There used to be several of these. Um, now there's one really, Barnes and Noble is the big uh, national book selling retail chain. And again, back when I started in the industry or back when Barnes and Noble started, which was actually after I started in the industry, these stores were places you drove to. Um, they were out on the highway, they were big. Um, you walked in, you had to kind of park your car and walk in the door. So they were, they were, they were called big box retailers and they had thousands and thousands of books. Um, and there were hundreds of these stores across the country. These days, that is not, that is no longer true. First of all, there's only one of these chains now, Barnes and Noble. There used to be Borders and there were a couple of other smaller national chains. Uh, nowadays there's just Barnes and Noble and Barnes and Noble is actually pulling away from, uh, this, this model of destination shopping and they're closing their leases out in the uh, out on the highways and buying leases on stores in downtown neighborhoods the stores are smaller and um ironically if you will they now look more like independent bookstores they they're smaller they have fewer titles they merchandise books differently and what's happened is that facing con competition from online retailers like amazon barnes and noble has decided to act more like indep an independent bookstore. Um, independent bookstores being, if you will, the, the sort of third channel I was going to mention. Um, it, these, are the, these are family or locally or independently owned stores that sell books. Um, uh, there are several thousand of them across the United States. And as Amazon has grown over the last uh, decade, so has the independent bookstore market. And it's because independent bookstores offer something that Amazon doesn't. They offer curated um, selections of books. They offer a, an environment which is pleasant to be in. And um, they offer expertise. And, and that is something that, as I said at the beginning, 
you don't really find on Amazon. You have to know what you're looking for to buy a book on Amazon. If you want to go and discover a book, you might walk into an independent bookstore, talk to the bookseller, or just browse the shelves or the tables. And um, the big the big chain retailers have decided that the future for them is not by mimicking Amazon, it's by mimicking the independent bookstores. Um, the uh, Another big channel for book selling in the US is what we think of as uh, quote unquote mass market retailers. These are places like Walmart, um, which you may be familiar with, other stores like Target and Costco. These are big branded retail stores that sell everything. Um, televisions, sneakers, breakfast cereal, um, sunblock, everything is in the store, including books. The thing that distinguishes these retailers from others is they don't sell they sell a lot of books, but they don't sell many titles. So the selection of books in a Walmart or a Target is going to be fairly small, but they do sell a lot of them, the ones that they choose. And of course, given the nature of their, uh, their business model, they tend to sell books that are already bestsellers. So they know that their customers are not coming in browsing for books. They know that their customers have probably come in for something else. They'll pass the books section and they'll see a book. And if they've heard of it, if they've, if they're aware of the author or they're aware of the, uh, they're aware of it, they may pick it up. So it's a very different model from it's the opposite end of the book selling spectrum from the independent bookstore. That's retailing. Um, the thing that I wanted to say about the U.S. market, which is um, quite distinct, and I think will be of interest to you as authors, um, because it, it really is foundational, is public libraries. Um, there are thousands of public libraries in the US. They are supported by local tax dollars. Um, they are run with a sense of mission and a sense of commitment to public service. And they provide a range of public services, um, including access to, it. I think li library's mission is dis dis defined as access to information, and that includes access to book books. And in the children's market in particular, it is a very important channel of distribution for us. And I think important to you and, and of interest to you because it's a, it's a curated channel of distribution. It's, it's, a, it's a market that buys books very, um, it's a very discerning market. It's a market that buys books very carefully on the strengths of um, two things. One is a review affirmation um, on what is considered good quality writing and publishing. And the other is what their customers need and want. So, and they do think of their clients as customers. Um, the children that come into public libraries after school to borrow books or read books or do their homework are thought of as customers. And public libraries have this sort of sense of mission, both to give them what they need, give them what they want and give them what they need. Um, it's a very big market for us. And I'll come back a little bit to how, um, how we sell to that market, because I think it's, as I said, it is foundational and it does sort of, feed a lot of what is above the line there. A lot of what happens in other book selling environments is, is supported by what happens in the library market. Schools are a big market for us, um, classroom libraries and educator needs, but it's quite, a, um, it's quite a distinct market and I'll come back to that in a little while. And then lastly, um, in the US, there is a big book fair and book club. Um, uh, industry largely run by Scholastic these days. Um, I'm sure will be familiar to you. This is um, these are either book selling opportunities, uh, book fairs that are placed into schools on a periodic basis. So Scholastic will arrive in a truck loaded loaded with books, little carts with books on them. Put them in the school auditorium or the school gym or the school dining hall, and there'll be a day when kids can go and spend their own money and buy books. Um, and one of the interesting things about this channel for us is that it is a barometer of kids' taste. Um, because kids, it's one of the few places where we know that children are actually making their own buying decisions with money that they have in their pocket. We have a very good sense of what they will buy if given the opportunity. And often it's quite different from what librarians might suggest they buy or what booksellers might represent. So. So that very quickly is where people buy books in the United States. Um, there is overlap and with other markets like the UK and, and markets in the EU, and there's there are differences and these channels sort of differ in, in sort of weight and strength. Um, the reason I started with 
where do people buy books is because um, when I acquire a book for publication, I'm thinking one of the things, not the only thing, but one of the things I'm thinking of is which one of these places am I going to sell a book to? Um, it doesn't have to be all of them, although obviously it can be. Um, but making a decision to publish is very much a decision about do I know where somebody is going to buy it? And can I, you know, once I've identified this is a book that will primarily sell to public libraries, or this is a book that really is going to be supported by independent bookstores, or this is a book that has mass market appeal that's going to um, publish across all these channels. You, you know, you make that calculation and you think about where is it going to sell and then how am I going to sell it there? Um, the other thing I would say about, about this is that success in one of these places can lead to success in another. So they're not sort of um, independent of each other. Um, different things drive different drive sales in different places, but they can sort of uh, fertilize each other, if you will. So that's where people buy books. Um, I guess the, the sort of associated question is why they buy books and, and you know, what, what kind of motivates people in the US. And I think, again, this is like book selling. It's, uh, it's a, a sort of a quick survey that will be familiar in some ways and may be different in some ways. It's some, many of these things are true for any book market. Some are kind of particular to the US market. And again, in thinking about acquiring and publishing a book, if the first question is, where do people buy the books? The second question is, how do I get them to buy the book and why do they buy them? So um, I think the first thing I think about, you know, the first, the first sort of motivator, if you like, is the author's story. Um, sometimes this is kind of crude. It's, it's, you know, what did the author's last book sell? Do they have a, do they have a best-selling track record behind them? Um, and if so, then presumably people who like the last book will, will buy this book. And I think, but I think that's kind of a crude way to think about authors. Um, what I look for is a story to tell about the author, um, not just, you know, what did the last book sell? And sometimes that can, you know, that can mean last book was made into a Hollywood blockbuster, but it can also mean this is a debut by somebody who has a really interesting personal story that we can tell to the public. Um, it, the author's story means a lot of different things, but there has to be a story. There has to be something, or perhaps that's, too, perhaps that's putting it too strongly. It is great if there is a story to tell um, about an author, if there's, uh, if there's a reason for the book that is, is sort of lies in the author's own personal history, or if there's a, a story about how the author came to, came to this book. Um, it's, it gives us a lot to talk about in publishing. So why do people buy books? I think often they buy books because they're interested in who wrote it. And our job as publishers is to sort of articulate that. And your job as authors is to, you know, in a sense, articulate that too. There are many ways that we can do that. There are many ways you can do that. Um, obviously, media drives book sales. Um, when we publish a book, we look for opportunities. If there is a story to tell about the book or about the author, we look for opportunities to tell it. So um, broadcast media, the radio, television still, um, the, the, print, the print press, um, book reviews, uh, feature media, all these are places where we can tell stories about authors and books. Um, Hollywood is another thing, although I wouldn't, I'm not going to place too much emphasis on this because it's sort of the, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of the black swan, um, but every so often uh, Hollywood drives uh, book sales. And right now that's happening more than ever. And over, as you all know, over the last decade, this has become a thing in children's and young adult publishing. Um, again, going back a few years, there were very few children's or young adult books that made it onto the big screen. Um, these days, there are dozens and dozens every year, um, whether it's for feature release or whether it's for a Netflix serial or whether it's, you know, somewhere else. There's a lot of translation of books into other media now, and that obviously helps people buy books. Um, social media, of course, uh, as consumer media has sort of receded as a place for us to publicize books in the US, um, social media has come forward. Um, social media means a lot of different things. Um, it's a very big and I think sort of amorphous and hard to, um, hard to track kind of world. Uh, 
it's a, this is a whole seminar in itself, um, a whole day long seminar on social media would, would not be too long um, about how to attract attention for books um, in, in uh, social media. But the, the thing about this that I always keep in mind is something that's very hard for publishers to influence. Um, it's much more a thing that consumers influence and indeed authors influence. So this is a, um, this is a, a platform that is difficult for us as publishers to manipulate, um, but powerful when it takes hold. Going back to what I said about schools and libraries, um, a big driver of sales for us is our reviews. Um, every book that we publish, we send out to a kind of um, baseline list of reviewers and review journals that cover children's trade books. Um, you will often hear American publishers talking about the number of starred reviews a title received. Um, what they're talking about is about uh, reviews in trade media that are highlighted with these little stars. They're the kind of top books in any issue. And those reviews really drive sales. Um, if American publishers some, sometimes seem sort of, you know, compulsively obsessed with starred reviews, um, that's why. It's because uh, librarians buy books on the strength of those reviews. Award committees um, look at books on the strength of those reviews. Um, and they really do help us place books in that uh, very important library channel. Um, there is a big world of opinion makers in the US in, um, in, uh, in the children's and young adult field, uh, people who blog. Um, this is true internationally, but it's, it's, it's a big factor for us. Um, we send a lot of people to, a lot of books to people who we know talk about books on public platforms and create opinion. Excuse me for a second. Um, last and last thing I was going to mention, and, and I mention it, I'm I'm well aware that I'm talking to an international audience. Um, one of the challenges for us in the U.S. when we publish books by authors who are not domestic, from, from other markets, from other countries, um, is getting them in front of people. Um, School visits remain a, uh, a big part of promoting books in our market. Um, there is a big, um, there's quite a big industry uh, around authors going into schools and talking to children directly. Um, and they, over time, this, uh, this work of going into classrooms um, and doing presentations by, um, is a, an important part of an, author's, an author building their, their visibility and their sales. Um, obviously, it's something that's very hard to do from afar, uh, particularly in the world of, um, in a pandemic world. But at any time, it's hard to do. But the reason I mention it is because there are increasingly, um, you know, again, sort of ironically, the, the world of, that we live in right now has um, increased, the, you know, increased the use of and the visibility of virtual visits. And there are a number of foundations in the U.S. that put authors into schools um, virtually. And it is increasingly becoming something that authors in other locations can do. So I mention it for two reasons. One, it's important, it drives sales. And the other is that it's not inaccessible to, um, to people outside the United States. Um, quickly, I wanted to talk, uh, I realize, you know, I'm running a little short on time. Um, quickly, I wanted to talk about the changing market in the US. What I think is sort of, I try to avoid using the word trends when I can, because it, I don't know, it feels ugly somehow and overused. I think the changes in the US publishing industry are, are probably pretty well broadcast. Um, one is a real awareness among publishers and consumers about, of representation who is telling stories for whom, whose stories are being told. Um, this is an ever, you know, this has been a, a present concern in the industry since I've been in it, but today is a more present concern than ever. Um, so, you know, our children's finding, our, excuse me, our children finding their own stories in the books we publish, are those stories being told by people who can relate? 
relate to those children and well our, our you know our, our is our staff um our, our employees our editors our publicists do they also represent um a diverse population so that is a that is an ever-present concern. It's an evolving concern and um, a real sign of health in the industry, I think. Um, I would say that young adult publishing has flattened out over the last few years. I don't think this is a new observation. Um, the, young adults, the, the young adult shelves have become very, very crowded with books that perhaps um, feel a little interchangeable. So what had been a real growth area in the industry uh, five years ago has flattened off a lot. In its place, uh, we're seeing a lot of growth in middle grade, a lot of interest in middle grade fiction, and uh, in the US, a lot of growth in nonfiction. Um, and nonfiction there means a lot of different things, but to me, it means um, strong narrative nonfiction, novelistic nonfiction, that is nonfiction that tells stories, um, not information books in the sense of, you know, facts, uh, light reference, and so on. It means storytelling that happens to be true storytelling. Uh, we're seeing a lot of growth there. The last thing, um, again, not news to anybody who follows publishing, but consolidation in the industry is a uh, a big thing. Um, with random with PRH just having acquired Simon and Schuster, it seems to be sort of you know Amazon versus PRH these days at the top end of the industry. But the reason I mention it is because as the bigger publishers become bigger, and as they become as their um, employees as their staff as their editors become more specialized within those big organizations it kind of open up opens up a, a market uh, for small small houses to really have an impact in the industry and certainly over the last few years um, one of the things that i've noticed in the us is that the uh, smaller publishing houses the small independent houses the new houses the um, publishers that are willing to sort of take a chance um, there's, there's growth in that sector of the industry. So um, the market for books, the market for, um, for agents, the market to sell your manuscript is no longer just, you know, the, 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 in the US is no longer um, a small number of large publishers. There's a growing number, there are a growing number of small houses that are able to make books visible. Um, so that's, that's an, an observation about consolidation. Um, Lastly, uh, I'll say a few things about what I think about when I acquire a book um, in the US. Uh, and again, not particularly different, I don't think, from uh, what a, a British editor or a French editor would tell you, but um, shaped by some of the peculiarities of the market. Uh, first thing I ask myself about a manuscript is whether it represents the the experience of the child uh, or the interest of a child or a young adult, um, you know, is, is it a story that a child is going to see themselves reflected in or going to be interested in? Sounds obvious, but, um, but not always. Uh, I look for storytelling, strong storytelling, whether it is nonfiction or not, uh, fiction, nonfiction, storytelling is everything, voice is everything. Uh, these, these are things you will have heard um, everywhere. Age appropriateness, um, does it have a, uh, an age appropriateness, I would say, is it, you know, is it a story about an 11 year old written for 11 year olds, or is it a story about a, uh, a five year old written for 16 year olds? Those things sometimes don't, you know, align in a way that is useful. Um, and I guess the reason I'm, it, as I said, it sounds obvious, but the reason I mention it is because in the US, as in other markets, the children's publishing industry is is very category driven very much segmented by age groups and if you go into a bookstore um you will see that you know these are these are books for 8 to 12 these are books for 12 plus um so being aware of that is obviously a, a an important part of an acquisition decision is there a point of attachment to the school curriculum what is the market opportunity uh, what is the author's history? Do they have a great social media presence? Do they have a track record? Or as I said at the outset, do they have a story to tell me about themselves or about the book that I can tell somebody else with enthusiasm and excitement? And then lastly, the last thing I'll say, because it's, uh, it's a good place to end, is does the book show me the world in a new way? Um, as Deborah said in her introduction, uh, you know, one of my interests is in the universality of stories, is what we have in common that can be shown through particulars. Um, that I think is the great 
uh, virtue of storytelling for children is that um, you can show children and young adults something that is shared through the experience of something that is very particular. So having the opportunity through Accord to publish voices from across the sea um, is wonderful because it, it meets that target, it meets that goal. It is telling stories about what we have in common through the eyes of somebody whose experience is different. So I'm going to end there. Um, that I think I, I filled my 20 minutes. Um, I would be happy to discuss, happy to answer questions. And I'm going to stop sharing this rather boring PowerPoint now um, and turn the uh, screen back over to, um, uh, to I think it's Deborah. the board, yeah. Simon, thank you so much. And it wasn't at all boring. It was absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm going to pitch in with some questions and ask everybody, please put your questions into the chat so we can, we can get to those as well. Um, age appropriate, that's an interesting one, isn't it? I often find um, myself questioning what that is and how do we define it? What are your thoughts on age appropriate? How do we... Yeah, then, it's an interesting question. I think... Um, I don't mean to sound sort of... Um, if you like a, a sort of prescriptive about that um, in the sense that, you know, I, 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 I didn't mean to say that I think that only certain stories are appropriate for certain readers if in that sense that, you know, you, there is no scope for children to read outside their, uh, their age group. Um, a lot of reading is aspirational. So there's a ton of interest among, you know, 10 year olds in what the experience of 12 year olds is like. So I, I don't think that, um, when I think about age appropriate, I think that, I think, I guess I think of it in the same bracket as um, uh, will it, you know, will it speak to my interests? Will it speak to a child's interests? Um, so there's no reason why a child can't read about the experience of an adult or a young adult and vice versa. But there does have to be a point of connection. Um, and sometimes I think the reason I mention it is because often I see I do often in the sort of acquisition process, see manuscripts where that connection doesn't quite line up, where um, the author hasn't thought through um, whether the, there's, a, there's a point of connection or not. Um, so it's not a kind of crude thing of you, you know, eight year olds only read about yeah. 10 year olds. It's more a matter of, is there a way to connect this reader with this, this, this subject? Um, so for example, you know, the, the sort of, I guess, you, you know, we th think do I'm trying to think of a, a sort of a crude example would be you know what is what is the right age for children to read about the holocaust for example when are they ready to process that information is it you know 14 is it 12 is it 16 so i think age appropriate is is is, is, a, is a subtle thing but it's um and but it's definitely there so how things are handled isn't it um you 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 can introduce subjects of like divorce, separation, death, um, all sorts of issues to children in picture books. Absolutely. Where you do it, and it's the language you use, and it's the examples that you give of those things on the lives of the child that I think are, that really are the, the tempo for getting that right. Yes, and I and I would speak. I would say that 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 is a you know from a mission standpoint, that's very important that we provide material that children need. Um, mm -hmm not just material that adults or their parents might prefer them to read. Um, children's needs are often different from what, you know, and, and children, you know, children and young adults go to the library, go to books for information that they can't get elsewhere. And I do think it's, you know, when we talk about age appropriate, it's, it's, it's a matter of providing them the information they need in a way that is appropriate to their needs. Yeah. Um, so yes, absolutely, divorce, you know sex education all those things yeah. are important yeah yeah and it's the language we use to to talk about it um what can authors do to help you simon if they if they get if they're <laughs> yeah um I, <laughs> I think uh it the first answer to that question is that everybody's different you know authors there, there's you know 
every author has something different to offer. Um, you know, as well as your strengths as writers, as communicators, you have different strengths when it comes to com connecting with with an audience and with the marketplace. So what you can do varies with what you think your um, what what you think your strengths are. Some people are very good at social media, have built a following on um, on uh, one or other platform, um, and are good at communicating with other authors um, or with other with with their audience. If you but if that's not you, then you can't sort of fake it. You can't you can you can't sort of invent it overnight. That's a that's an organic process. So um, I think the first answer to that question is, is you know, use your strengths. Um, if you are, a, you know, if you're a good communicator on social media, that's great. If you, um, if you can, if you are an essayist, if you prefer to communicate in long form, then look for places that you can put your name into the marketplace elsewhere by writing op-ed pieces or columns or contributing to journals or whatever it is. Um, I think making, you know, I mentioned that it is increasingly possible to make yourself available to the, to a foreign market through virtual appearances. It's something that we've, um, you know, it's really exploded over the last two years with the pandemic. Um, and I think is now starting to, to mature a little bit, um, to take shape. So we know what, what virtual appearances work and what, what don't, but if you're comfortable speaking to children, and in this case, speaking over a Zoom uh, camera to, to audiences, look for those places that are sponsoring virtual appearances by authors in classrooms or in front of professional audiences. There are a number of them in the US. Um, I think be willing to, um, to make connections, uh, to connect with, you know, don't be shy about connecting with other authors, uh, with your peers, and talking about your work to your peers and asking them to talk about it, um, to amplify what, what you're doing. Um, oh, what else? I think, um, you know, the author energy and author enthusiasm comes in so many different forms. Um, I just grab it where I can get it. You know, I, I, I think, as with writing, you look for what people are good at and uh, look for how, how they communicate well and look for places to, to use that. Um, but I think, you know, I will say as a publisher that I appreciate authors who, whose work doesn't stop when they deliver the manuscript or sign off on the proofs. Um, that is not the end, that's just the beginning. So while there are many, many ways you can participate, um, participation is key. Um, uh, authors who sort of, you know, disappear and start writing, writing on the next book, that's fine. But it's, you know, I love authors who, who take part in the public sphere um, in which their work is, uh, in, in which their work is living, however that, however that works for them. So that was a rather sort of soft answer, but. Um, I'm going to now put you on um, the hard answer answer. Um, we asked our last speakers what mistakes people can make when communicating with agents. What mistakes with, with agents? No, no. But what what mistakes can authors make when dealing with their publisher? What what do you find harder to cope with? What makes it harder for you to do your job in terms of um, author publisher relations? I um, it's a good question, and I'm and and I'm sort of you know if I'm slightly circumspect about the answer, it's because again I don't think there's one answer that fits every circumstance. But what I, you know, authors do something that I can't do, which is create work. Mm -hmm. I can do something that they can't do, which is, um, you know, marry their work to a market. That's my job is to sort of midwife the book into the marketplace. So what I try to do is listen to them when it comes to the act of writing. So my job as an editor is to read and respond and then listen to what the author's point of view is, what their voice is, and try and be a sense of reader. The flip side of that is that what I hope for from an author is that they will listen to me 
when I talk to them about the marketplace. So mm -hmm. whether it is a cover, um, a cover design or a publishing strategy or um, a request to um, present something in a certain way or, a, you know, to, to, I hope that the, the, the biggest mistake I think an author can make is not listening to the expertise of their publisher when it comes to what their publisher is an expert at. As on the flip side, I think the biggest mistake a publisher or an editor can make is not listening to the author when it's a matter of the author's expertise, which is, you know, communicating through the written word. So I think my, you know, my biggest frustration when it comes to author relations is not being listened to when I know what my job is. And I know that what my job is, is to make them more visible in the market. Um, that's a somewhat general answer, but I think it's the, I think it's true. Especially as publishers are there to, for themselves and for their authors to ensure the success of books as much as possible. And while if we could ensure the success of books, it would be like a gold mine. We wouldn't have to, we would be, we'd know exactly which books to acquire. And we never really know until they hit the market. But ultimately our goal is to get them to book the books to work. Yeah, and I think um, an important part of that is that when, when we acquire and publish a book, we, you know, success is not an absolute measure. It's a measure relative to expectations. Um, so, you know, you might acquire a book with the expectation that you're going to sell a million copies, or you might acquire a book with the expectation you're going to sell 5,000 copies and everything is sort of geared around that expectation. And I think um, my job is to communicate that to the author and say, look, this is, this is how we see it. This is what we think is going to happen. Um, and we measure success in relation to that. Um, so I think communication is, is critical there. Mm. Um, Patrick, who you know, and I'm going to hold mm -hmm. up. Hi, Patrick. Um, Norton's edition of Patrick's book, Playing a Dangerous Game has asked if you're going to, if you're planning on widening the witness, eyewitness series to real life experiences of writers outside the US? That's a great question. Um, so Patrick is talking about a series that we've actually just, just publishes on, the first book's published on Tuesday. Um, oh, good. I happen to have a copy um, of the first one, which won't, it's, uh, Where are you? Oh, there um, we are. These are first person, these are nonfiction. They're kind of a nonfiction version of I Survived, if you like, um, which you may be familiar with. It's a big, successful series published by Scholastic. They're first person narratives by young people about things that happen to them, um, challenging things that happen to them, uh, whether you know politically or circumstantially. So the first book, is, the first two books, one of the authors is a young woman who, uh, she's a Muslim American woman who were suffered um, from the sort of racism and discrimination that took place after 9-11 um, in the US. Uh, she was imprisoned on sort of specious charges of being a terrorist as a, as a 15 year old. The second book is, and I think actually Patrick, this does go to your question. The second book is by a young man who grew up in Puerto Rico and his, it's his account of um, living through Hurricane Maria um, who, and what he sort of did as an activist to try and help people after. Third book, and this does answer your question, Patrick, is by a young um, Afghani woman. She's uh, from the Hazara minority. And she was, you know, as a young, this is a Malala-like story. It was, it's about a young woman trying to get access to education um, in Afghanistan and facing the um, prejudices and you know, socially restrictive world of the Taliban and eventually fleeing Afga Afghanistan to come to the US. Um, all these stories, I think actually in some ways are kind of not domestic. They're about the experience of people who have come to the US for one reason or another and brought, you know, have, have been seen through a, a lens as outsiders. Um, the, th the fourth book is actually by somebody who is, is, is much more domestic. It relates to the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so yeah, Patrick, we are broadening this, you know, in different directions. One is, you know, more international and more domestic at the same time. The, the real goal of this series is to be, is to, you know, uh, it's, as I said in my talk, um, to sort of 
show what is universal through the very particular experiences of others. And in this case, it's a nonfiction format. Um, these are wonderful books. I, I, I really recommend them. They're, uh, they're, they're really, and they're really fun and accessible as well as being on hard topics. They're great reads. Yeah, thank you. So th these are the examples of your narrative nonfiction. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But great storytelling, which is, uh, so important. Yeah. The core. Um, a few people have asked throughout the course of the day uh, about this uh, self-publishing versus publishing, publishing. Yep. What are the benefits of self-publishing? Are there benefits of self-publishing? It's a good question. I think there can be. Um, you know, the, <laughs> well, the benefit is obviously that you, you have control and you you retain ownership um and if you have the resources and the energy or the connections or the history to get attention for your book on a platform like you know amazon self-publishing platform then i think it's a reasonable option um and there are a number of success stories, you know, whether it's either of people who have decided to go that route and have, you know, in a sense, you're kind of setting up a business. You're not just an author, you're, you're making yourself a publisher and you have to do all the other things that publishers do. Um, marketing, publicity, inventory, you know, all that stuff, you have to manage a business. So I think if you have the capacity to do that, I think there are upsides to it. Um, I think it's, it's sort of democratizing, um, you know, publishers, if they're doing their job well, are good at curating and providing access to market. Um, if they're not doing their job well, they're kind of, you know, they're, they're not gatekeepers so much as gate lockers, um, which is not always the best thing. I think, you know, there are all those stories of books that, you know, had a hard time finding their way to market and became classics, you know? Um, so I, I think, you know, I think there are re reasons to do it, but I would caution, I think the cautionary note is that you can't self-publish a book and expect people to find it. Um, it's, you know, our job as publishers is not just binding the book and putting a cover on it. It's putting it into the marketplace and providing distribution and creating visibility. So I think, you know, I think the pluses are control and ownership and income and uh, maybe, you know, lack of frustration. Um, the minuses are you, you can't do it in your spare time. You have to do it as a business and you have to have the skills to do it as a business. Yeah. And um, Barnes and Noble and the independents and the big box stores and the libraries are not going to see you. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's really uh, you you're communicating one on one. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Um, I was really interested to see that you said that YA is tailing off in the US because in the UK YA is booming at the moment, <laughs> and it was not possibly of not very many books, but book talkers, book talk. Yeah. How are you seeing that impacting? I, I think uh, well, certainly I think there's two parts to that the answer. One is I didn't mean tailing off so much as sort of flattening out. Yeah. I think it's, you know, the YA was the driver for quite a long period of time. That was where the growth was coming from. And I think the growth is now coming from more places. Um, YA is, I'm, you know, I didn't mean to say it was flat. It was tailing off. It's just sort of flattened out of it. Um, I, yeah. Very unreliable narrator. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. Um, and I may have misstated it, but I, but I think, and I think there's a kind of, I mean, this may just be me talking, but I, I think there is a lot of um, sort of, it's, it's much harder to get books. The, everything looks and feels somewhat like the other thing in YA. You know, that, there's that thing that's happened where everything started to feel a bit li like everything else. That said, um, to your other part of your question, yeah, we're seeing the impact of book talkers um, and it's mystifying. I, I, you know, I understand it, but I also don't know how to, yeah. catch hold of that the tail of that snake you know i i don't get it in the sense that i don't understand how you manipulate it how you manipulate it how you yeah. take advantage right. of it 
which is great. I think it is it is the democratization of you know um, what we do. It's 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 the audience taking control of the narrative, if you like, and creating it. Um, which is scary for us. We like to control things and we don't know how to do this. We don't know how to control it. So we're certainly seeing the impact of it in the US. Um, we're sending a lot of books to people who claim to be book talkers. Um, and I think they're getting a lot of free stuff as a result, t-shirts, books, shopping bags. Um, but I don't know that we really know how to, how to sort of drive that. But it is exciting, isn't it, that it is reader driven? I mean, I Absolutely. And I, I think, um, you know, just a personal observation, when I was growing up, reading was kind of a solitary experience, yeah. you know, something you did by yourself in your bedroom at night. Now it's something that people just, you know, they share. It's a bit very social experience. And I think book talking is sort of the, you know, is it's, it's, uh, it is exciting, but it's also scary for us institutional publishers who like to think we control the narrative um, and we can decide what, you know, what's important. We don't. Um, yeah pandemic has made the sharing more vital do you think that it's something that people are talking much more about reading in the last couple of years or yes and no I think I think yes in one sense um I think the challenge with the pandemic has been that um people have kind of defaulted to what they know and it's been much harder to make books new authors and new things stand out um the the place you know particularly less so with fiction in the middle grade and young adult categories, but certainly with picture books and younger books, there isn't that sort of um, discover, you know, discoverability. It's been harder to put books in front of people during the pandemic just because they're not out in the stores um, or, or in the, even in the libraries or going to events, you know, book signings, that kind of thing. So I think, I think people have defaulted to what they already know, authors they already know, and the trouble with the social media influencer world of publishing is it is it does tend to sort of be a bit of an echo chamber. So it reinforces the same things and it's hard to break in. Um, so I think the pandemic certainly has increased the sort of public discussion of what's being read, but I'm not sure that, the, that it has broadened the discussion of what's being read. Well, thank you so much, Simon. And I'm going to ask you one last question as we... we monopolize you'll be able to go and have your breakfast in a minute <laughs> somebody has there's a question as a writer based in africa the u.s market feels so advanced and out of reach if this is somewhere we should is this somewhere we should aspire for our books to get to what will it take and what are the merits of such aspiration well i think the answer is yes and the answer is certainly yes um and that is why I'm sitting here today and why, you know, Sarah's sitting where she's sitting, I think, is that we share this belief that stories, the, the stories belong in other, you know, in other markets, in other cultures, in other places, that there are readers for them. And that if there is a, a story that connects with a reader in the US, then, and a voice that wants to be heard, then yes, you should aspire to it. I don't, you know, I, I would, I would say you don't have to. I mean, it, it really, you know, if you feel that your story is local, then your story is local. But, but I think, you know, the world is getting smaller. People are communicating more easily and readily. And the, the inverse of that is that people are curious. You know, I think that there's a real receptiveness. One of the things I, I mentioned that, you know, when I said that representation is a big part of what's, front and center of US publishing, the US publishing mindset now. That has meant, I think, something somewhat domestic for a while. It's meant that we want more domestic voices to be heard. But I think as that has started to, that need has started to be addressed, people are looking out. They're looking for voices from beyond the borders to come into the market. So absolutely, I think it is something to aspire to. I think there is a interest and the barriers are coming down you know the 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 market is becoming more accessible both in the sense of access to publishers through institutions like accord but also access to the public you know social media virtual events um the world is the, the u.s publishing market is more accessible now than it was and it will that will only continue um so so i absolutely think it's important and i absolutely speaking as an american publisher would say we're looking for it. We're looking for breadth and 
um, you know, uh, a breadth of voices, a breadth of points of view, a breadth of experience, because we know our readers are looking for it. Well, what a perfect note to finish on. We're going to let you go. Thank okay. you very much, Simon. It's been lovely to see you. I'm sure everybody's just got so much from your talk. It's really fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you. I hope it was useful. And, uh, you know, you, you, we look forward to hearing more. Have a lovely day. Thanks. Bye. Marvellous. That was fascinating. I love that. It was um, really eye-opening. I think that um, um, often writers, um, as writers, we can um, look at um, publishing more just from where we're standing. Um, and, you know, in terms of producing the work, but understanding kind of um, some of the history around how markets um, have grown, um, understanding a little bit where the opportunities are for, for, for the works that we want to produce, that I find can be um, very helpful. And I think Simon's um, perspective ties in so well with what we're saying at Accord, which is that there is a global marketplace for, um, for African books. Yeah in African books for young readers and Accord's partnership with Simon um, is evidence of this. Simon's evident, um, clear commitment to publishing books from, from around the world um, is another sign for this. And, um, you know, the question about should we aspire to, to have our books enter these marketplaces is yes, we do have a responsibility to tell our stories as broadly as possible, because if we don't, you know, someone else will tell them for us. So um, um, that, that's one of the main points we, we hope that we can all take from, um, from this session with Simon. And it's, it's absolutely time that um, stories, uh, in to use the phrase from the US, which I, I read recently is falling out of favor, but own voice stories are really vitally important yeah. because um, as we've known for a very long time, stories written by visitors to places come with a lot of assumptions and preconceptions, some of which can be quite dangerous. And we, yeah. we hear stories that actually represent a place and represent people's lives in with authenticity and truth. Yeah. And of course, that can be anything from a, a story, a social drama to um, a full-on fantasy. It's you, you, you as writers have the right to write whatever you want. And it's your point of view that the world is looking for. Yeah, absolutely.